Hi, I'm Nadia Fall, and I'm Artistic Director of Theatre Royal Stratford East. And I'm Adam Penford, Artistic Director of Nottingham Playhouse. Hello, Nadia. Hello, Adam. <laughs> this is lovely. <laughs> it's so nice to be hanging out on Zoom together. Or is it? I'd much rather be in a room with you, but this is the new normal, so it's fine. That's absolutely right. <laughs> I was trying to think before how long um, we sort of known each other and where we met. It was a while ago, I think. It was at the National Theatre, definitely. And I'd been assistant director to Nick Heitner for a few years. And then um, there was a new kid in town and that was you. And I was like, who is this person? Um, and I was determined to hate you, of course, no. Um, but you were so lovely and brilliant and funny. And um, that's where we got, yeah, that's, I think that's where we became friends. Oh, I think that's right. And now we run buildings in Nottingham and East London, proper grown-ups now. We've grown up, haven't we? It's scary. Apparently, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when you told me about this idea of the revival, I thought it was genius, especially wanting to talk about work and remember making work when our theatres are closed. So where did the idea come from? Yeah, um... So I was inspired by a, a long-running Radio 4 uh, documentary program called The Reunion, uh, which brings together a group of people who all played a part in a certain moment of history together. So it could be, I don't know, the Olympic Games or uh, the miners' strike or something. Um, and it brings together, you know, so for example, miners, people from the coal board, MPs, uh, a newsreader. Um, so, diff so you look at something from a 360-degree angle. And I thought how amazing it would be if we did that with uh, an important or landmark theatre production that uh, we were associated with. Um, and Bring so... the band back together somehow. Exactly, get the band back together. Um, you know, and that could be creatives, actors, writers, directors, but it could also be um, somebody who played a part in helping with the cultural or historical context, like a historian or someone who was part of the research of the show to really offer... Um, a fully rounded view of that production. Um, and I thought the first episode could be uh, The Madness of George III, which I directed. Um, and we had that conversation yesterday, didn't we, bringing the cast back together. The Madness of George III by Alan Bennett premiered at the National Theatre in 1991. Starring Nigel Hawthorne as the King and directed by Nicholas Heitner, the play was a huge hit, touring the UK and transferring to America. Hawthorne's performance was described in variety as a masterful blend of integrity, compassion and humour. He was joined in the 1994 film adaptation by Helen Mirren. The movie was nominated for four Oscars. The play explores a period during George's reign when he battled mental illness. The royal doctors prescribed the torturous medicines of the time, including blistering and laxatives. As the King's illness worsens, the Prime Minister, William Pitt, tries to hide the truth from Parliament, whilst government grinds to a halt. Meanwhile, the King's eldest son, the Prince of Wales, has his eye on the throne, and teams up with Pitt's opposition to try to force the Regency Bill through Parliament, which recognises that the King is no longer fit to govern, and grants the Prince power instead. He also ensures his mother, the Queen, is no longer able to see his father. Dr. Willis is brought in, who specialises in mental illness, but can he cure the king in time? In 2018, The Madness of George III was produced at Nottingham Playhouse. The production was described as sensational, phenomenally good and theatrical gold, with the Telegraph critic declaring, by George, Mark Gatiss has got it. The production was broadcast into cinemas worldwide via NT Live, one of the first theatres outside of London to do so. We're joined today by Mark Gatiss, who played the role of George III, Adrian Scarborough, who played Dr Willis, Deborah Gillette, the Queen, Sarah Powell as Lady Pembroke, Adam Kareem, who played Fortnum, and Professor Arthur Burns from the Georgian Papers Project, whose knowledge of the period greatly helped the cast and creative team during production. Mark, George III, a very challenging role, closely associated with Nigel Hawthorne, who played the role originally on stage and in the movie. So what was your original reaction when I phoned and offered you the project? Did you know the play? You, you, you asked me in person, as I remember, in the dressing rooms at Park Theatre when we were doing Boys in the Band. Um, I was, uh, 
Oh, I, it's weird, isn't it? I, I remember being thrilled, actually, by the idea. Intimidation set in later on the way home, I suppose. But, <laughs> but I, it, I'd never thought of it. I've played a couple of kings, uh, Charles I, George IV, and, uh, but it hadn't really been on my radar, despite the fact I'm a, a huge and long-term fan of Alan Bennett. And uh, so I, I was just glad you thought of it, really, I suppose. Um, and then, obviously, the... The, the legacy is is very uh, the shadow is very long as it were uh, of of the great Nigel Hawthorne. So I I, I never saw it. I, I I knew the film. I never saw the play, but I, I'd read it several times. I remember reading the introduction where how Alan talks about the fact he was drawn to George because he was he was a dull king, <laughs> which is a quintessentially Bennett thing to to do. And he had the dullest court in Europe and stuff like that. Which, but it was this the humanity obviously is what appealed to him. And I think the I think that's what appealed to me as well. The it's it's really it's it's two things. It's the idea of the the person representing the country, the man the man as monarch representing the health of the nation. But much more important than that, it's just the personal thing. I think that's why for me, the, a film like The King's Speech is much more interesting about about George the Sixth's personal struggle than it is that he's the monarch. It's just about what people go through. And I think what the play does brilliantly is is just strip away all that and show the the the, the torment and the, the the agony that the family went through really and everybody around him went through. I think it's it's just a fascinating piece of work. So I was yeah thrilled and scared. And a moment to acknowledge the beauty of your background backdrop there. Yeah. Oh well, this old thing. Well, I just <laughs> this is my home in Barnard Castle, which I just <laughs> popped up to. Hang on. There we go. That's better. <laughs> now I can see it. <laughs> well, I've got a question for Arthur. Um, we know Alan, Alan Bennett um, studied history, read history at Oxford, I think, and they were the original letters at the Windsor Library. But, uh, and he struggled, I think, at first um, about deviating from the real historic facts and making a juicy drama. So I want to ask you, how... <laughs> Our George, the theatrical George, and the real George the Third, are they um, similar or very different? I think they're, they're quite similar. I mean, one of the things I was struck when Mark and I went round uh, Windsor together, looking at the documents, and I'd not read the play for some time before that, and I, and I had to, went back and looked at it again. How many of the phrases in that? In the, in the play actually come straight out of the document or capture the, the, the resonance or the rhythm of the voices you see there. And, and that rather took me aback actually, because he didn't see the original letters on the whole. What he saw were other people's accounts of them or listening to historians talking about them. And I think he captures that really well. He squashes people together, often in rather uncomfortable ways. Um, so Lady Pembroke has got bits of other people in and uh, so have some of the doctors because there are rather more doctors around in the original. But I think the flavour of the interactions works really well. The, the one thing that's very striking is it is slightly of its date in terms of its account of what the illness is. Mm. And um, that you could imagine the play looking very different on that. And I actually working with you all made me understand that in a way I hadn't understood it before. I'm now writing about that and... You know, the porphyria diagnosis, this idea that it was this kind of physical ailment rather than a kind of um, um, manic depression thing. Actually, if you look at the plotting, it's all about the manic depression. Mm -hmm. and, and the diagnosis is sort of just stuck on at the end because the books Alan read to get the plot were ones written at the time and everyone thought it was manic depression. But he was writing it at the point when the, the, the opinion had moved to porphyria. So it's, it's really interesting how that diagnosis is sort of there but not quite there. In the play but apart from that I think it just captures so much and it's partly because when Alan was at university it was the high point of the study of this stuff so everybody was right on top of this material and I think he was taught by Richard Pears one of the great uh, historians of this so that comes through I think. As, um, as you were saying there Arthur that you know <laughs> Alan was a historian um, and that influenced his interest in wanting to write the play but he also um, drew on his personal life and I was thinking Debs about the um, there's a bit in Alan's book where he talks about um, his mother had a, a mental illness and his father used to drive 50 miles every day to the hospital to visit his mum in hospital. Um, he was that devoted. And, and, and it was because 
the, and um, Alan puts it in the play. He says that how will the doctors know when my mum is better because they don't know what she was like before she was ill. And, and, and the Queen has a line really similar to that. How can the doctors restore him to his proper self, not knowing what that self is? Um, yeah. It struck me that the relationship between the king and the queen, although there's a formality there, there's a true love, I would say. Would you agree with that? Completely. And I really feel that you got that from the letters as well when uh, you were going through them and the intimacy are very conversational and uh, they were a real team. She got what the deal was to be his wife. I was looking back over the research that we did and that she sort of written him a fan letter and then he decided that that's the woman that he would marry, even though he had other women that they thought he would marry. And I knew that he was a bit sort of shocked when he saw her. She was a bit of a fright. But they were, they, she was his, she was his homie. That's what I really loved is that she didn't question. She gave advice. She knew what the gig was. She gave him 15 children. She was quite mighty in that respect. <laughs> that's one thing the play gets right more than some of the historiography that was written before the play, actually, where the, where the Queen's a rather dismissed figure, there's endless reference to the fact she's ugly and, and so on. Mm. And I think the play helped put her back in the centre of the picture in a way that later people write about her have actually done rather more with. Yeah, the, the fact that they were quite domesticated, I know they were considered boring, but the living... Um, at Windsor and the walks, the the red, you know, the church every day, the setting off as family to go strolling. I mean, quite quite simple pleasures, which is really touching. It is. It's very touching, I think, and it's, it is really the foundation of the idea of a modern monarchy. And more, it's more. It's like a Scandi novel, a, a Scandi model, isn't it? Of how it's supposed to be. It much more yeah. so than our current regime is. In a way, it's it's like a sort of really tight unit. And another relationship that I find is really fascinating is between the women, the Queen yeah. and Lady Pembroke. And obviously when the King is going through his breakdown, he makes all these really overt advances, sexual advances to Lady Pembroke. And, and what do you think that, that Sarah, the relationship is between the two women? Is it one of sort of respect or friendship or solidarity? Or is it more complicated than that? I think it was pretty straightforward um, friendship um, and support, really. I, I always thought that um, the Queen would not, um, it, it's, you know, that position is, can be very lonely. You've got to quick, choose the people around you quite carefully. And I always thought that Lady Pembroke had been chosen for her utter fidelity and, um, and friendship. And, you know, at the end of it, um, she was rewarded Lady Pembroke with, um, with a, fabulous house in Richmond, um, to which she lived out the rest of her days. Um, she, she was very, you know, she was very loyal and she was very well rewarded for it at the end. I went and had tea there one day um, with my mom. It is actually absolutely stunning. What, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, this, this was a good reward for all that <laughs> molestation and abuse. This was worth it. Look at what I've got. Yeah. It's fantastic. Really beautiful house she was, she was given. To live out the rest of her days in but I, yeah I do think it was always um it was pretty uncomplicated support and and uh faithfulness and trust to the queen I suppose the complexity around the the royal family uh, and then the 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 politicians the MPs and then all the the servants doing their duties that it's, it's very complex that we had to build that into the stage picture Adam and I was I was reading the other day Nick Heitner's um, sort of autobiography uh, and he tells this brilliant anecdote that um, someone who was an aquarium at Buckingham Palace once approached him and said uh, when we're training we're told to watch the film of the madness of George III um, in order to learn how to stand how to bow correctly how to enter and exit the room correctly how did you know you know the historical truth of what all that was and Nick had to reveal to him that they just made it up. It was just pure theater. <laughs> they just, it was movement, you know. Um, I mean, I suppose we spent quite a bit of time on that, didn't we? How, playing one of the footmen. Uh, how did it feel to, to, to do all that etiquette? And also standing around for long periods of time. It was watching the NT Live and the close-ups that I really began to see the level of detail 
between the, the uh, footmen in, when they're through glances, how much inner life is going on when they're not allowed to express anything? How was that as an actor? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess it's kind of useful in a way having those kind of rules set up gives you something to work with and to choose when you break it then as well, doesn't it? So as a team, you have strict rules. You can't look at the king in the eye and things like that, I remember. But as the condition worsens and we have to bend and break some of these rules, it's interesting then for the three of us about who did what. Um, Papandit, who's like the very loyal one. Billy, who like reveled in the sadism, um, <laughs> I think. And I think and Fortnum myself was more interested in pinching the candles and setting up a shop as soon as possible. <laughs> It is a good joke, isn't it, that he's gone off to, to set up a provision merchants in Piccadilly. It's a good look. <laughs> but true. It's true. Yeah, true. it's true. He did them. Um, they insisted on fresh candles every day. And so he was taking the leftover ones and plugging them. <laughs> the very best thing, the very best thing about being king is to not have to do any of that movement. <laughs> it was my heart flooded with joy when I realised I didn't have to bow to anybody or even <laughs> it's just marvellous <laughs> my question's for Adrian and I think we met we first met on Habit of Art one of Alan's plays yeah you've done tons of Alan Bennett what what makes Alan's work so special what do you love about it I love the fact that it's so domestic um <laughs> That that's the thing that always makes me smile. It just comes from a from a familial domestic place. And I love the fact with this play that it's you know that essentially it becomes about the way that the royals behave, um, you know, in a day to day setting, in a castle or in, in a palace or you know with their politicians. It all becomes about well, good health for sure, but. <laughs> It, yeah. but it's demonstrated so brilliantly through sniping <laughs> mostly between father and son um, uh, and just about marriage and just about relationships between people which you know Alan writes I think completely brilliantly so wow I mean he does this thing between ordinary and extraordinary like you know everyday people being extraordinary and then extraordinary kings and queens being ordinary and very, he, very he's good mundane. at that yeah. yeah yeah and very witty and along with it bloody hilarious mm. <laughs> adrian you had told me of a technique during rehearsals i don't know if you remember this um that if you've got to speak if, if you're doing an rp speaking character in an alan bennett that there's a way to access the line if it doesn't quite scan do you remember what that was <laughs> Did I say do it as Alan Bennett? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's so true. He, he, you can you, you you can try out any line really uh, as Alan Bennett to see if it works, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> it's it, no, it. it's incredibly <laughs> helpful because he because he does have a he has a very very particular lilt and a way of speaking, and um, particularly as he's got older as well, it's sort of become much more. Um, whiny uh, the older he's got and it's also a bit more lispy now because uh, it, probably because his teeth aren't so good anymore I don't know but yes it just to have that tune in your head is a very very wonderful way of being able to bring it to life I think it helps me do, do Hamlet do Hamlet as I <laughs> it. oh uh, to be or not to be, that's the question. Whether it's nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. See, I listened to that for hours. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rather bloody good. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk a bit about um, how you approached um, the king, Mark. And I thought it was absolutely, completely disarming the way you did it physically. I used to work in a um, mental health uh, hospital and I just felt so like how vulnerable and human he is when he's at his illest, if you like, and, um, and how you feel his humanity, the more vulnerable he is. It was extraordinary. Um, and a, a, a brilliant performance. How did you? How did you begin? How did you um, approach the whole thing? 
but I suppose part, partly, of course, it's to, to, to not be like Nigel Hawthorne or, or David Haig or anyone else who's, who's played the parts. You, you, you want to do something different. But I was sort of, because I went to, to Windsor before we, uh, in the middle of rehearsals, actually, I was, I was quite heartened by the fact that really nobody knows exactly what was wrong with him anymore. The porphyria diagnosis is kind of slightly debunked, isn't it, Arthur? And, and it's, it, as a breakdown, it seemed to me the possibilities were kind of endless. And the, the weird thing for me is I've spent half of my entire career denying the fact that being brought up opposite a mental hospital had any influence on me whatsoever. Because it's, oh, cool. in, it's brought up in every single interview I ever do, and because it's a Wikipedia entry, you know. And this, this unassuming 1930s mental hospital has assumed the proportions of Arkham Asylum in the popular imagination. And, but for this one, extraordinary, it was exactly what I drew on, because I, I worked there as a gardener, and, and I knew a lot of the patients very well. And, and I, I drew on all sorts of them, a lot of the ticks and a lot of the... The, the strange sorts of manifestations of different kinds of, of mental illness I drew on directly, uh, some of the physical stuff as well. I, I suppose it was that, it was really just, I thought, well, he, he has a colossal collapse of some sort mm. and it manifests itself. Some of it is, is, is essentially Tourette's, isn't it? It's the, the, he says and does the wrong thing. He, mm. he, he, he's subconsciously very attracted to, to Lady Pembroke and then when when the when the veils are down, he just goes for it, and you you see that sort of thing all the time in people with various sorts of mental uh, illnesses. They, the, the the filters go, and suddenly everything's up for grabs, literally. <laughs> sometimes, um, so it was that really. I I just thought, I thought I th I think it's this this colossal strain of it. In a way, he's. Like a lot of monarchs, like George VI, actually, he's not really cut out for it, but he has a tremendous sense of duty and religious duty too. And I think he just cracked. I mean, he just couldn't couldn't stand the strain of it. And then, of course, um, I think he says this a bit, that actually uh, giving into it is incredibly liberating. And but at the point but where Dr. Willis starts to suspect that he's actually slightly putting it on. It's because it's a bit like lockdown. We don't really want to stop now. It's <laughs> Some of it's lovely. <laughs> and you actually just, you know, there's an amazing liberation from putting on the straight waistcoat mm. because it allows you, weirdly, it frees you at the same time. Mm. I, I found after you done this, well, I started reading the later instances of his mental illness in the 1810s when the doctors again still writing daily reports. And every day he does a religious ceremony there. Uh, before he eats, he, he set, effectively does his own little communion ceremony, and he's still talking about Lady Pembroke all the time. Um, and th that's happened to 20 years after this. Wow. So it's very striking just how deep seated all this is, I think, in terms of his psyche. The one that got away. <laughs> yeah. Arthur, do you want to just expand slightly on the diagnosis? Because when Alan first wrote it, it the play ended with a, a, a a modern day doctor coming on stage and talking about Extraordinary the fact, McAlpine, yes. yes, and saying that we now believe he had porphyria. That's right, isn't it? And I, I heard Nigel Hawthorne hated that scene and demanded it was cut, although Alan includes it in the published edition. So, where are we at now? Because that's also been debunked, hasn't it? So, I think we're slightly a house divided at the moment. So, there are certainly some people who still think the porphyria uh, diagnosis is, is a very strong one. Um, there was a lot of work done on genetic evidence in the 1990s, including various people going around Eastern Europe finding deceased German princesses who could be uh, disinterred to check their DNA on this. And they also wrote to crowned heads of Europe asking for stools in the best Dr. Peeps tradition. And one of them <laughs> sent some, astonishingly. <laughs> you know, and so they tested all, all, all those. Um, so, but the, 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 the other side of the, 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 the argument, which is to look at it as mania or something related to manic depression, has begun to make a bit of a, a comeback, uh, some very detailed work uh, along those lines. I, I guess my own feeling, having read a lot of this now, and I'm writing about the 200 years of interpretation just at the moment, is how much does it really matter in, in the sense that the, the lived experience of it seems to me the key. I mean, very much what Mark was saying, that it's very hard to avoid the points of contact with his his life and he even some of the weird stuff he does so he goes around marrying everybody 
uh, offering new combinations all the time and, and, and talking to people who've been long dead, uh, including his children. And so that whatever it is, it's rooted in his life in terms of how his, his mental life is proceeding when he's unwell. And I, I, I think actually the question of what caused it, it belongs to a kind of medical history. It's not really the only kind of history that matters here. Uh, it's important, it's worth finding out, but it, but it doesn't tell us very much, I think, about uh, George's experience. And we have so much stuff on this now that we, we can just explore. It's very rich material, some of it available for the first time. And of course, the three doctors in our production were all played by female actors, actresses. Um, so we had gender blind casting, but we also had uh, color blind casting, uh, deaf and disability blind casting. It was, it was a very diverse production, which was really interesting because um, that was generally really well received. A few people wrote in about um, historical accuracy, not just of that, of anything to do with props or costumes. So I suppose I'm sort of conscious of the fact that against the backdrop of Black Lives Matter at the moment, um, it feels like we're making steps forward as the theatre in terms of representation, but there are probably still more to be made. Um, Sarah, is, is that right? Do you think we've made good steps? I think that's I think that's fair. I think um, I remember when this came out. Actually, it was shortly after um, Madness of George III. The original production was either while I was at drama school or just after I'd left drama school, and um, I went to see it, and it was you know brilliant and enchanting, and we all absolutely loved it. But I sat there, and there were two women on stage, and no black people, and I just you just accepted that there was no place in that on that stage in this kind of drama for someone who looked like me um, or who looked like Nadia or who looked like Joshi or Adam, you know, there was just, there's just no place for us. It was brilliance and there was, there was nothing for us. So this production, I mean, I particularly loved the, the three women doctors. They just cracked me up every time they were on stage. I mean, and no reference was made to it, but each one of them, Louise just being so vicious. And, um, you know, Amanda is just sort of bumbling around as peeps with her stool. They were just so beautifully, they embodied those characters so beautifully with nothing, addressed about you know their their sexuality they were just brilliant actors um, and Stephanie portraying those roles and suddenly you know they were there Adam was there you know I was there and it was also any any young people that I met that didn't know the original they just assumed it, it ne they never questioned that it was they just thought they were women doctors you know they just accepted yeah. it it wasn't a, a sort of something that was wrong about it or strange or anything it was just they were brilliant those characters and they were just beautifully yeah. imagined. Nadia is um, Fitzroy, <laughs> so manipulative and devious and horrible. Without, yeah. you know, it was just such a beautiful characterization of that 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 role. Um, that yes, it does feel that that we've um, that we. I think there are steps. There's a long way to go, obviously. But well, I, I, I thought it was really interesting that it worked so well for, as an audience member that you could both look a very historically authentic production, and I thought it really did look authentic in all kinds of ways and also have this approach to casting at the same time without there being any sort of tension between that. I, I thought that was really interesting. Maybe maybe wigs help in that way in this sort of the, the <laughs> extent to the costume everybody's in. Uh, may, maybe um, it was where the join worked, but it was I thought it was wonderful. And as you say, you just didn't think about it at all watching. Well, I mean, you it was were fantastic. It's, just, it's not just the right thing to do. I think it just makes theatre richer and more relevant to young people um, and you just you know whenever we sit down we suspend our disbelief and we go with the show and it just it just makes it a lot more alive I think especially for new audiences so mm. it yeah. also feels incredible I think you know, theatre is about 25 years ahead of of the movies and tv right. isn't it it's something it, it it really is uh just creeping into tv and, and and films which are things that we used to do i don't know if you remember them uh <laughs> but uh, theater has, has really led the way and uh uh yeah I, I absolutely as you say it's it's a much richer experience it's also you know you sit in the audience you see yourself you see the possibility you can get there yeah. it's it's yeah. the same as a class division you just if you don't think it's possible you don't you don't enter the the thought doesn't enter your head. Yes. You think, oh, that's not for me. Yes. And if you just go, my God, look, it's all there in front of me. It's all possible. Then, then you, you know, you're making that step onto the stage yourself in mm. five, 10, 15 years, whatever. Um, it's vital. 
What did Davis you want to say? As well, I remember Sarah at the beginning, by casting a wider range and having that extra richness, it means we can tell more of a story as well. At the beginning, with the confrontation with the king, we have a citizen of the empire there. And that was another piece of the historical story, just through presentation, that you don't have if you just have them a white cloth. I'd forgotten about her actually, yeah. and yeah. I and I'm so glad that we made that choice, Adam. Yeah, yeah. Um, that we made a that that she was, you know, we, we had a lot of discussion about madness, didn't we? And that what madness was or what mental illness were, and the the thought that this that this woman may actually have had something in the Caribbean that she felt was owed to her, and nobody else believed her. And what does that do to a human? And um, you know, trying to kill the old king with a bread knife, butter knife, sorry, um, fruit knife. <laughs> I was really pleased that we had made that choice because the alternative was my trying to do a Geordie accent. That's right. We had a lot. Of, we had a lot. Of, we had some. We had some accent workshops, didn't we, Sarah? <laughs> no, it would have been nice. Very and good. I would not have enriched. I think, <laughs> um, the final production. Adrian, I've got a question from the fans. Oh, yeah. um, Dr. Willis doesn't come on till about halfway through. Mm. What Just before the end of the first half. Your... <laughs> yeah, yeah. What, what do you do? What do you do with yourself in the dressing room? What's going on? You sit there and you get very, very frightened. Because <laughs> oh, the tannoy's on. Because the tannoy's looking... on, but also you're watching everybody coming and going and doing their thing and doing it brilliantly, and they're all sort of hyper and in it and up there, and and uh, it, yes, you get really, really scared. <laughs> but what I did do. Um, I shared a dressing room with uh, um, the polymath that is Lord Gatiss, and um, and I would make his tea it's true. for the interval. It's so, good to be the king. <laughs> so I would go and I would before I made my true. entrance, I would fill the kettles up for, yes. for the interval, and I would set the biscuits out and the mugs, and I would put the tea bags in the mugs, and I would sort of try and settle my head. By uh, by doing something completely different, keeping busy. Rituals, it's rituals, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. But I tell you what, what's wonderful about it is that you get to hear it every night, and because that dialogue is so juicy and so rich and so lovely, there were loads and loads of bits that by the end of the show I was sort of reciting off pack because you just you'd heard them so many times. I just kind of knew them, and now I I quote the play continually at home. <laughs> there, there are things now that have just sort of become part of common parlance in our house uh, <laughs> because they're just so fabulously quotable. It's great. And of course, the, the other thing you did, Adrian, was made an earlier sneaky appearance, didn't you? Well, we don't like to talk about that. We will. <laughs> I did make an appearance uh, right at the very beginning of the play. But um, yeah, 10 quid for the person who can spot me. Push, it's push and pull, isn't it? Scarves. That counts, does it? <laughs> That's an old actor's joke, isn't it? I don't think, I don't think we can know what Paul was pushing to live. That's another thing that's gone. Yeah. <laughs> recent grads listening, that's when you got paid a little bit extra to move the scenery around. Doesn't really exist anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, Debs, mm. um, I rewatched the NT Live recently and it struck me watching the play um, that it's partly about information management. So the MPs are very conscious of exactly how much their, um, the public and the, um, uh, the rest of the parliament are knowing about the this, um, seriousness of the illness. That strikes me as being incredibly contemporary. So whether it's about mm. fake news uh, or how you're presenting yourself on Twitter or even when Boris Johnson was ill, you know, trying to, how ill was he? Was he able to govern the country? Who was in charge during that period mm. of time? Um, I don't know if you agree that it sort of, it feels like it resonates in terms of that. Completely feels like no, nothing has changed at all. We don't really know what's going on. You still feel there's a whole world that we are not, they're making decisions about us and we don't know. And it, it's very much that. And even, even the Queen doesn't know and the King doesn't know. It feels in the play that there's, there's just levels and levels of information. It's very hard to get to the core of it. Yeah. And actually, 
it's also, Mark, I think in, just before we went into rehearsals, there was an article in, I think it was the New Yorker, where somebody called it the ultimate Brexit play. They said the, the mm. King's nervous breakdown is mirroring our national mm. nervous mm. breakdown around that. Um, and, and, and it feels like it resonated in, in, in that way. And I remember specifically, you had mentions of Europe in the text, oh. didn't you? Yeah. This is one of the great, this is a great joy of theatre. And I, I, I remember, Deb, remember when we were doing Three Days in the Country, the National Theatre, mm. and we, there was a, I used to come on uh, with Deb, being be the second act, and drenched, we used to pour water on ourselves, and I had to take off my hat and say, summer. And throughout that play, that, that, that got a huge laugh in the middle of the summer because the weather was terrible. <laughs> and as it shaded into autumn, it got better. The laugh went away. Was it? it was fascinating, yeah, and, it, yeah, and, it, yeah. and in George the uh, Third, there was one particular, one particular matinee, I think, when it was mm. there was an absolute spike of news about Brexit, and I had to say to Pitt, to uh, to Bish, um, "What of Europe, Mister Pitt? Nobody has mentioned that yet." And it was a string, the response was extraordinary. I mean, it was like the biggest laugh the theatres had in a hundred years, and then. Even by the Monday, it had slightly dropped because yeah, it was just, that's the most wonderful thing. It's, it's sometimes without any, I mean, I might have lifted the line a little, but, <laughs> but without no. any pushing, events just crowd in on and suddenly give it a resonance you just didn't expect. You know, it was, it was wonderful. It was amazing. Yeah. It just it charted it through the run. The NT Live version actually is one of the nights where it doesn't get a particularly yeah. struck. So I was thinking of ahead for that when I was watching it again and it doesn't I remember when I saw it in this form back in you know the 1990s it was the uh, Prince Charles lines that got the laughs then all that you know, oh, the yeah, Prince yeah. of Wales predicament yeah. stuff because that's the stuff that yes. felt really topical then now it's, it's fascinating not quite, it? I think it, it also means that you know every play or all good plays have a life which which is also unpredictable you, you could put a play aside for 20 years and think, oh, that's, that's had its day, and suddenly turn it over and go, oh, my God, <laughs> it's incredibly relevant. I think that's what, that's what happened with Journey's End when uh, David Grindley rediscovered it. It was a sort of sixth floor of War Horse. And then suddenly you read it, just go, this is the most incredibly beautiful piece of work. And, 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 and a great play, I think, like George has that. It, it can be all kinds of things, really. I was going to ask about, I remember being an assistant on the very first NT Live, actually, Adrian, the habit of, was it the habit? No, it was Phaedra at, at the National. Yeah. And, um, and I know actors talk about doing an NT Live being a bit weird. Um, Deborah, could you talk about what it's like doing an NT Live as opposed to doing the play, or is it the same? I think it is, it is weird because you are playing to the house. So you have a a performance that fills the theatre but then you're aware that there's a camera so one fears that it's just too big too much what you're doing because you're you're allowing for things to resonate to fill the auditorium so I, I I've always felt anxious about that I'm never quite sure where you pitch it I know you're always sure all do it as you would always but then I, I have watched it and I'm so impressed by everybody that you kind of do need for it to be taking in the house because it is a piece of theatre but you feel like you're there in it watching in a theatre so it really I think it really works I won't I won't worry so much about it if ever I if I, I do one again because I've watched other ones thought, there's something so thrilling about the sound of the auditorium filling up and mm. it does it does give you the excitement of of lie you're just terrified if you do something wrong or you forget something you drop it because it's there forever you don't <laughs> want to fuck it up for everybody that's the thing but they really do work i think they they, they are theatrical but then you get the close-up every, every so now and then and then in, i remember a sideways eye that adrian did in a habit of art which is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my entire life is sideways eye that you'd never see if you were sitting 10 rows back so I think they are special in, in some way. They're scary though, aren't they? Do you know, I mean, they they, we were so, so relieved. The relief when it's over. This is a, mm. this is a very strange uh, experience for all of us because it was a very short run, really. It was just under a month. And we actually managed to, we had essentially like five opening nights <laughs> because there was a gala, there was the yeah. press night, there was the opening night, there was empty life. It was like, a, and I think 
we had a re we had a dress rehearsal for NT Live, which end we ended up sort of doing six shows in about forty eight hours. It was it was absolutely re relentless, and then of course you get to the end of the live thing. It's just oh my god! Thank God we've just got to do the show now, <laughs> and then then it was only on for about another week. So it was a strange uh, strange yeah. experience, really. I thought it must be hardest for those who were doubling up parts. Whereas I guess if you've got the distance in an auditorium where, where you're getting very close up sort of face shots of, of your of the way you're acting and you're trying to differentiate two parts, that must be particularly mm -hmm. difficult, I'd have thought. But it, again, I was struck it didn't bother me when I watched it. At, That's um, I was thinking that, Adam, because you get to play uh, one of a footman and then you get to play a second footman for the enemy. <laughs> yeah. <going to> the <laughs> prince. Yeah. I remember, I remember, I can't remember if it was Amanda or Louise coming back to the dressing room in a completely different costume, going, I don't think I was meant to be the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the joys of NT Live and, you know, it's been great to hold this conversation because it's coinciding with the National Theatre, uh, re-releasing The Madness of George III for people to watch it around the world. Um, Mark, Arthur, Adam, Deborah, Sarah, Adrian, on behalf of Nadia and I, thank you so much. It's been lovely to have you and we've really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. What? what? Oh, thank, thank you. you. What? Hey, hey. <laughs> hey, hey, what, what? <laughs>